Hi guys, it's Fiona here. It's the weekend again and it's time for another podcast. This week I've had a special request and it's from Isabella in Brazil. She contacted me on Instagram and said, can I do the one about why fairy tales are really scary tales? This is an academic reading passage three and my goodness, yes, it is probably as a difficult as you get. So before we start, there's just a, there's a blog on my website called IELTS Time Management for the Reading Test. I'll put the link in the comments. And this particular reading um, uses a lot of these techniques. So remember, you've got just 20 minutes, but it's a really difficult topic, I think. And there are three different question types. The first question type is matching um, sentences. So they give you the first half and then you match that with the second half. Um, the second is gap fill, but they give you the answer. So it's not a word from the text. That's quite difficult. And then the third set of questions is multiple choice. So my goodness, you're dealing with three different question types, which aren't all that common, to be honest. So when you look at my time in management blog, you'll see, um, you know, the, the advice to just get used to that variety of question types. So on the day, you're not panicking when you see that kind of uh, question. The other thing I mention, it's tip number two in my management time management blog is um, no, it's number three, learn about text structures. I talk about this so much. Uh, I'm not sure how clear it is, but there are two very different types of texts. One of them is simply descriptive. It's factual and, and very often chronological, meaning it goes in order of time. So all of those history of silk, history of glass, um, history of Marie Curie, they will all be very quite very simple, um, you know, dates and times and events. But the type of text we're looking at today, and it's most passage three texts, is, is discursive. It's theoretical and it's based on somebody's idea or theory and the research and evidence to back up that theory. Now, it's a very typical what you'll get when you go to university and, and you have to think critically about concepts or beliefs that are accepted and you'll have to question them. And this is exactly what the writer does here. Now, tip number four, five on my blog is um, looking at the title. Is It's all about using textual clues. The title will Ill usually indicate what type of text you're dealing with. And this title does that. The question why fairy tales are really scary tales means it's posing a question. Um, and even the subtitle, another textual clue, says some people think that fairy tales are just stories to amuse children. But their universal appeal may be due to more serious reasons. So immediately we know that we're going to hear the things that people normally think about fairy tales. That will be the background. And then that attitude is going to be challenged or questioned. Then there will be some research or evidence to um to back up, to support this theory. And then other theories will be used to actually disagree <laughs> with the theory that the writer is putting forward. That is a very typical passage three. Um, and it's academic style. It's, it's common. You can get used to it. Uh, I've got a few on my website, things like... Um, 
the one about the kites to build the pyramids. Um, you know, most people assume the pyramids were built, uh, you know, using machines or wooden things. <laughs> but actually, this theory is that they were built by kites. And it's got evidence, it's got research, they tested the theory. And then people disagreed with them. And this is exactly the same. So Isabella, if you're still listening, sorry for the long introduction, but I'm going to show you how you can break down that structure to um, make the reading more manageable. So we'll look at the first paragraph. The first paragraph says every culture has fairy tales and Many stories that we know have different varieties in different cultures. So you, you could guess that. They give the example of Little Red Riding Hood. I'd love to know what you call that in, in your country. Um, so the story you know about the little girl who goes through the forest and she's told to be careful because there's a wolf and the wolf eats her grandmother and, and so on. There's different varieties of it, I'm sure. Uh, you have a different version. So that's the background. That's the story, the first paragraph. Now, of course, um, they'll come to the theory behind this. So the second paragraph says um, the, the reason why these tales are so popular, people believe, is because they contain cautionary messages. Um, messages to teach children um, to be careful. So, you know, the message here is that you should listen to your mother and avoid talking to strangers. Um, and, and it introduces the researcher. He's an anthropologist called Jamie Terrani at Durham University in the UK. And he is the one that's going to question the, the idea that these stories have lasted because they teach us about survival. So that's the original theory. He's going to question this and he's going to say that his research suggests otherwise. So he's done some research and he's going to prove this theory wrong. Um, he says... We don't really know much about the history of storytelling. There's a gap in our knowledge. And all of these people who try to uh, give theories, um, they, they haven't really tested the theory. Now, he is going to test the theory. He's going to be different. He's going to use a unique uh, a technique from evolutionary biologists. Evolutionary biologists try to find relationships between things in a process called phylogenetic analysis. Now, that word is in inverted commas. This is another one of the textual clues um, that I talk about in my time management blog. Because it's in inverted commas, you immediately notice it and you know it will be important. It's often a word that you don't know and they don't expect you to know it, so don't worry about it. Um, they explain it. They say this is a process called phylogenetic analysis. It's an approach where they study uh, the relationships between organisms. And Terrani has used the same approach. Goodness knows how, but he has. <laughs> and basically to compare the related versions of the fairy tales and to discover then how they have evolved, how these stories have changed, and which parts of the stories, which elements have survived the longest. So he will argue that the parts that have survived the longest are the most important parts. And therefore, we can work out why they survived. So he focuses on Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and it says that he looked, he found he discovered 58 stories recorded from oral traditions. That's quite important. That's spoken, not written. 
And this analysis did indeed establish that they were all related. Um, so it talks us through how he did this. This is the test part of the structure. And it starts with first he tested. And that's common again. That's when they're testing the theory. First, he tested some assumptions about which aspects of the story alter least. So the ones he thinks which stay the same. Um, now, he, he questions what other people, people believe. He says other folklorists believe that the story is more important than the characters, that it doesn't matter if it's a red riding hood, if it's a girl or a boy or what kind of animal it is. They say that the story is the most important thing. Now comes the big however. However, he found that there was no significant difference in the rate of evolution of the story compared with that of the characters. So, so he says, actually, the story changes a lot. The other people said, you know, that the story didn't change. But he said, actually, yes, it did. Um, so, so this means he proved that the central story is not the bit that lasts um, the, yeah, okay. <laughs> then it comes to the really big surprise came when he looked at the cautionary elements of the story. So remember this theory that the stories were designed to give a warning and that's why that they still remain to this day. So he looked at those elements and he said in his analysis, these elements weren't really important. Um, they were actually quite trivial details, these warnings. And that begs another question then. What is important enough to be re reproduced from generation to generation? He asks that question. He said, look, it's not the story and it's not the characters, and it's not the warning. So the next paragraph, again, first lines here, and all of this summary is based on the first lines. The answer, it would appear, is fear. So this is the conclusion from his research. We're nearly at the end of the article. The answer is fear. He says, these bloodthirsty, horrible aspects of the story, uh, such as the eating of the grandmother by the wolf, turned out to be the best preserved of all. So, so the most important part, he thinks, is actually this, the, the horror of the story has been maintained, um, even though the other features are not. This is his conclusion. Um, and he gives a reason. His, his reason for this is that as long as you've got something um, horrible, like uh, the, the wolf then uh, says, being swallowed by a wolf and then you cut his stomach open is so gripping that the story remains popular, no matter who tells it. So that's important because not everybody is a great storyteller. He says it doesn't matter as long as it has this element of horror and fear and that's what keeps the story alive. That's his theory. Now you've got two people who disagree with him. You've got the capital letters of Jack Zipes and he is unconvinced by Tirani's views. He says, even if they are gruesome, they won't stick unless they matter. He has another theory. He believes it's the theme of women as victims which makes them relevant. Tirani disagrees with this because he says in Chinese and Japanese versions, the victim is often a boy and the villain, the bad person, is often the woman. So, Tehrani disagrees with Jack Zipes. The final paragraph is Matthias Klazen, another 
um, person at a university in Denmark, says he isn't surprised by Terani's findings. He says, okay, habits and morals change, but the things that scare us and the fact that we seek out entertainment that is designed to scare us, those things are constant. So especially the, you know, the fact that we still watch horror films, we enjoy horror films, and, and these things are constant. And Klassen, Matthias Klassen argues the reason why these stories um, developed and is because they teach us what it feels like to be afraid without actually being in real danger. So it builds up resistance to negative emotions. And that is the last line. All right. So you can see it's, it's full of theories and ideas and trying to prove them. So let's go and have a look at the questions which go in almost exactly the same order. Question 27. Now, this is where you have to find the end of the sentence in a box. So there are five sentences and six possible endings. I think the easiest way for me to do this is to simply give you the answer. Um, 27 says, in fairy tales, details of the plot, and in the text it says, often take a variety of forms in different parts of the world. So the answer here is show considerable global variation. That's literally the first line of the text. Um, details of the plot show considerable global variation. Synonyms in different parts of the world, variation, variety. Um, yes, so that's 27. 28, Tehrani rejects the idea that the useful lessons for life in fairy tales so what did he reject? He didn't agree that this cautionary message was the reason that they survived. So the answer here is uh, the reason for their survival. He rejects the idea that the useful lessons for life are the reason for their survival. 29. Various theories about the social significance of fairy tales. <laughs> this was a really difficult one. Um, it's still in paragraph two where you get the various theories and it says this hasn't stopped anthropologists, folklorists and other academics devising theories. So despite the fact that um, we have this huge gap in our knowledge, they still developed these theories. So the answer here is that the various theories have been developed without factual basis, without factual basis. They developed these theories even though we have this gap in our knowledge. Question 30, insights into the development of fairy tales. Again, so difficult, I think. It's in paragraph three where they introduce this term phylogenetic analysis. So insights into the development of fairy tales. Insights, that's a key word. How do we learn more about fairy tales? Well, remember... He used the approach of the phylogenetic analysis, which is a biological approach. And 30 says, may be provided through methods used in biological research. So these insights into the development could come from the same methods they use in biological research. Finally, and we're still only in paragraph four, 
all the fairy tales analysed by Terani. Now, here we've got a number, a textual clue that can help us. Remember, he found 58 stories. So what did all of these stories have in common? In the text, it says he ended up with 58 stories recorded from oral traditions. And the answer then is all of the fairy tales were originally spoken rather than written. Um, they were from oral traditions, so spoken rather than written. Now, the only one we didn't use is D, contain animals which transform to become humans. Well, that's simply not true. And we see that trick coming up later in the questions, in the multiple choice. Okay, so yeah, horribly difficult. And the second part doesn't get any easier. The only benefit of the second part is that it's gap fill summary. And it has a title, and the title is Phylogenetic Analysis of Little Red Riding Hood. So you go straight to that term with the inverted commas, and it, it goes into paragraph four, where we finished, exactly where we finished. In fact, there's some overlap. It says Tirani used techniques from evolutionary biology to find out if something existed among 58 stories from around the world. So what did he want to find out about these 58 stories that he could find out using evolutionary biology? Well, Evolutionary biology was all about finding relationships between organisms. And he was looking for relationships. He says the analysis established they were indeed related. So that's what he was using it for. So we need to find out if something existed. If they were related, then links existed. He wanted to find out if links, which is number or well, letter D from the box of answers. He also wanted to know which aspects of the stories had fewest something, fewest, meaning the least something. And when you go to paragraph five, first line, it says, he was testing assumptions about which aspects of the story alter least, which aspects of the story change least. So you're looking for a word meaning changes, and it's a noun, and it's countable because fewest tells us it's countable. And the answer in the box is had fewest variations. The synonym is alter least as it evolves. He wanted to know which ones did not change as he believed these aspects would be the most important ones. Remember, he argued that the things which stayed the same were the most important things. So the ones with the least amount of changes. Um, the next line gives us a clue where to find the answer. The next line in the summary says, contrary to other beliefs, he found. So we're going to see what he found that was different. And the next paragraph six starts with, however, Terani found no significant difference in the rate of evolution, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the summary, it says, he found that some something that were included in a story tended to change over time. So we need to find out what he found, what changed. 
And he says certain episodes are very stable because they are crucial to the story. But there are lots of other details that can evolve quite freely. So there are other details in the story that evolve, other incidents. And that's what we're looking for, incidents. And in the box, the synonym is events. So he found that some events tended to change over time. Again, contrary to what other people said, they said the story always stayed the same. Um, he was also surprised. So we're looking at what else surprised him. And that's the next paragraph. But the really big surprise came when he looked at the cautionary elements of the story. The cautionary elements. That's the warning elements. Um, so he was also surprised that parts of a story which seemed to provide some sort of something, were unimportant. So remember what the theories were? They said that this warning sign was the most important, but he found actually um, they were trivial. Trivial meaning unimportant. So the answer for 35 is C, the warning actually was trivial details, unimportant. And finally, the aspect that he found most important in a story's survival was what? So remember that paragraph, I think we're down to seven, where he says the answer, it would appear, is fear. Bloodthirsty and gruesome aspects were the best preserved of all. So we need a synonym for this horrible aspect of the story which survives. And in the box, we've got the answer horror, which is answer G. So, yes, Isabella, I totally feel your pain. I looked at the answers for this before I started. I know I shouldn't, but I, oh, gosh, so hard. Okay, yeah, that's a good time management technique. Just look at the answers. <laughs> All right, so we've moved on now to the last four questions, and they are multiple choice. Um, I often find in multiple choice that there is an overlap. It kind of gives you a quick answer. Look at this one. What method did Jamie Terrani use to test his ideas about fairy tales? What method did he use? Well, we know now what method he used, but let's look at the choices. A, he compared oral and written forms. No, he didn't. He only collected oral, so it's not A. B, he looked at many different forms of the same basic story. Yes, we know he did that. C, he looked at unrelated stories from different countries. No, he looked at the same stories. D, he contrasted the development of fairy tales with that of living creatures. No, he didn't do that. So we go back to B. That's our best bet. He looked at many different forms of the same basic story. Yes, and that is clear from the start anyway. And it's in paragraph four. So you do have to go back a little bit if you want the exact words. And it says... His analysis focused on Little Red Riding Hood in its many forms. That's it. But we knew that from the start, so that's not difficult. Now, we'll go to, for 38. We'll go to the, the, the final um, two paragraphs, the ones we haven't already looked at. When discussing Terani's views, Jack Zipes. So remember the capital letters? This is in the last paragraph but one. Go to Jack Zipes and what does he suggest? So when we read through it, um, his, his main suggestion was 
that it was the perennial theme of women as victims. Um, right, so A, Terani ignores key changes in the role of women. Not relevant, no. B, story.